And as always, to make sure that the system is working, could you please go to the Q&A window and type the name of the country where you are located. So this way I will know you can hear me and also will make sure that the system is working and I can receive your questions. So we have Victoria from Lithuania. Oh, one of my students, very nice to meet you, Victoria. We have uh, Yula from Ukraine, uh, Shahab from United Arab Emirates, Sophia from Hungary, Justin from Thailand slash Canada slash the United States, very good. Um, Zoha from Pakistan, Alexandra from the United States, very nice. Uh, Mafer from Ukraine, um, Amar from the United States of America, very nice, very nice. So we have a bunch of different countries here, very good. Okay, so um, here is what we're gonna do. Uh, first, we will, uh, I will give you a quick update on where the program stands at this time and very, very briefly summarize what happens next. Uh, the reason I will summarize it extremely briefly is because we have a recording of the last semester's webinar like this one. And in that one, we went in a great detail explanations of how Exculture works, what needs to happen. So not only do you know that already probably from the pre-project training, but if needed, you can watch the recording of that uh, webinar. And instead, um, I would like to allocate a little bit more time for questions and answers. First, I hope there are some students here from the early track, so for whom the Exculture project is almost over this semester. In case you guys have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. And then obviously we have a bunch of new students who may have a lot of new questions. And I see we have many professors here, which is great. Uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity for them to also join us and maybe share some words of wisdom with you um, about their experience in Exculture. But I would like to start with a story, and uh, the story will end with a question, so let's see if you will know the answer. So there are these four people, four, let's say men, not to be sexist, but let's say four men, who are trying to learn how to swim. And so they figured it would be very hard to learn to swim on their own, so they decided to hire teachers who will teach them how to swim. I don't know, in a month or in a year, they decided to cross the ocean or swim in the ocean. And they know the ocean is big and vast and dangerous with big waves uh, and, and, and wet water. And so they're not sure they will be able to prepare for this journey across the ocean on their own. And so they hire uh, teachers, but turns out that each teacher had a different uh, teaching style. Uh, the first teacher, he was, um, uh, I don't wanna call it lazy, but he believes that the only way to learn is to uh, allow students um, to experience real life without any teacher intervention. So what he does to his student, he puts his student in a boat, rows the boat all the way to the middle of the ocean, throws the student in the ocean, rows back to the, to the shore and goes to sleep. Thinking that, well, if the student wants to learn how to swim, we need to put him right in the middle of the real action and not even pay attention. So if, this, if he survives, he survives. If he dies, well, too bad. That's the only way to teach uh, students. The other one is the opposite. He's very cautious and he knows that the ocean is very, very um, dangerous and very, um, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of things can happen. And so what this teacher does is he says, you know what, it's a little too early for you to get into the ocean. So what we will do with you here is here is a book about the ocean. Why don't you read this book? And so I will also tell you a lecture. And so he stands in front of the students and tells them all day long about the ocean. And he says, you know, ocean is big and the ocean has uh, water and the water is wet. And if you go under the water, you cannot breathe. So uh, he assigns his students uh, books, readings and lectures. The third uh, teacher understands that you probably cannot learn how to swim from books and lectures only. So he adds some interactive components to his course. And he also shows students some videos uh, of, the of the ocean, of the water. Uh, he includes some interviews or guest speakers who actually know how to swim and they talk to the students and they even play some games. So not only do they, uh, the students or the student, not only he listens to the, uh, to the professors and uh, guest speakers and watches the movies, but they would stand on the shore, let me take this off. And so and the student would try to, you know, to, to, to paddle and see how, how it works. And then the last, the fourth professor decides to do something different. So he takes the student to the ocean, but not all the way to the middle, kind of, you know, like halfway and uh, puts the student in the real water, in the real ocean, 
but keeps the boat right nearby and says, that's okay, try, try swimming, I'm here. If anything goes wrong, I'll help you. So there is really nothing you can do to, uh, you know, to hurt yourself. So you can try whatever you want. Here are the instructions. Follow me, I'll show you how to do it. And no worries, I'll catch you if you start going to the bottom. So the question I have for you is, which of those four professors or teachers, or I don't know, yeah, teachers, I guess, uh, will have the most prepared student when the time comes to get in the middle of the ocean and swim on your own? And I think you can answer that by typing the answer one, two, three, four in the Q&A window. So one, throw in the middle of the ocean and forget about the student. Two, lectures and books. Three, lectures, books, videos, and games in the classroom. And four, in the ocean, but under the watchful eye of the teacher. So you can try whatever you want, but that's okay, we got you back. So, oh, everybody votes for four, that's very good. And that's precisely what Exculture is trying to do. So uh, obviously, you know, if you wanna swim, you have to get in the water. So if you wanna learn how to swim, you have to get in the water, and that's what we believe. But at the same time, we believe that it, it does help, uh, you know, in the early stages, to try it in a safe environment. So in an environment where you can try the real water in the real ocean, but at the same time under you know, uh, the conditions where the cost of a mistake is low. So where if you make a mistake, you will not uh, drown, uh, but just gain the experience. And so that's precisely what Exculture is trying to do. And so I'll give you a quick, and yes, we are always nearby. If you make a mistake, even if you end the game, the, 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 the project, with enemies on five continents uh, because you had team members from five continents and you did everything wrong and you became, I don't know, not friends with them. That's okay, it's not a big deal. The cost of a mistake is not very high. You are learning in the process. So we don't really believe that books and uh, even guest speakers and lectures are enough, but at the same time, again, it's a relatively safe environment and that's precisely what we wanna do here. So um, there are two things that Exculture is trying to accomplish. One is the international experience. So um, you will be placed on teams, the, the new ones. So th those who are not in, in Exculture yet, in case we have some students from the early track. You will be placed on teams on Monday. You will receive your team assignments. Um, I've done it 41 times now. And every time I promise myself that I will form teams in the morning so that you get your assignments by the midday. Every single time, every single time you are receiving your assignments closer to the end of the day. And we are talking the New York time zone. So for most of you, that's like late, 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 deep night, or maybe even morning of the next day. And the reason for that is not because I'm lazy, but because one, many of you are still not done with the readiness test. And on Monday, we will be getting extra like 100 people or so per hour. So we have a total of about four and a half thousand people expected in the late track. And so many are done, but like the last thousand will be taking the test on the last day. And so every time I'm ready to form teams, I'm looking at the list and I see like literally like every 20 seconds, a new person is added to the list. And I'm like, okay, let's give them another hour to finish. And so I wait until like afternoon, but then it takes several hours, like literally four or five hours to form teams to make sure that everybody is matched by age and work experience, but different uh, in terms of cultural differences. So you will be placed on teams on Monday, right? And uh, so there are two things. One, obviously you will, or at least we want you to gain international collaboration experience. So we want you to complete a project with people from different countries so that you in real life with real time zone differences, cultural differences, online collaboration, institutional differences. So we want you in that environment to experience how it is to work with people from different cultures. Uh, people will have different values. People will have different traditions. People will have different holidays. People will have different understandings about how teams should be managed, uh, managed, led, coordinated. And so we want you to experience all of that. And then also um, uh, the second component is the business consulting. So when we did Exculture in the early stages, uh, we had um, a hypothetical case study. I believe the very first time it was, if you had a million dollars, what kind of business would you open? So and basically you had to write a business plan uh, for a starting capital of $1 million. That was fine but it was not really real life, right? So it wasn't quite the same as when you have a real client who wants your help and who wants to hear from you and 
see your solution. And so I think it was 2013, so seven years ago for the first time when we had a real client with a real challenge, Mercedes-Benz incidentally, I believe it was the first one. And ever since we would select a bunch of companies and they present challenges and um, um, that's what you're working on. In the late track, I'm still hesitating. So we have 14 companies. Uh, in the early track, we had nine but then more interesting new um, companies with cool ideas and products and services came along and said we want to participate and so uh, we have prepared everything for 14 companies uh, so we have the challenge instructions and everything but i'll be honest with you i'm still a little hesitant uh, if it's a good idea to have that many uh, for you i guess it would be more choices for us it's a lot of work uh, organizing those webinars uh, like each company usually has two webinars that's like 28 webinars for me so it's like half a day each time so it's like you know literally more than a week of business time just to organize them to prepare the videos so i'm not sure if i want to do that second my worry is that the companies when they join xculture they hope for numbers so they hope that there will be a lot of people working on their challenge and so they will get a lot of ideas we know that many of those ideas perhaps will not be you know groundbreaking revolutionary but they hope that the more students choose them the more the greater the chance that they will get some good ideas from you and so if we have a lot of teams i mean a lot of companies that means there are fewer teams per company so we'll have to see so uh, but we'll definitely have at least 10 and possibly more and i think i posted the first nine uh, a long time ago and i just need to add the remaining five we'll see how many literally today uh, and yep, so that would be the international experience and then the business consulting experience. We'll talk about the mechanics in a minute. And again, it may be best if the professors talked about it. I see quite a few. So if you are a professor in the audience, raise your hand so that I know that you're one of the professors and I will add you so you can maybe share some words of wisdom. But just a quick update on the numbers. So where we stand now. <clears throat> so we have, as you know, two tracks. We have the early track and the late track. And the reason for the two tracks is that um, we have, uh, I think, students from 92 countries this semester, of which um, uh, 42 countries are the countries, the location of the university. And then we have a bunch of what we call non-student participants, either teenagers or professionals. And so they come from additional, uh, I think it's like 90 countries, unique countries, but if you add up all of those, we get 92 the, this semester. And so especially those who are at the university level, in the university track, uh, the semester starts and ends at different times at different universities. And so one schedule would not work for everybody. And so because of that, we have to have uh, two tracks. And so the early track is already well in progress. And so we have 1,400 students in it, 1,396, if I remember correctly, as of yesterday. And so they have two more weeks to go. So they will be finishing in, uh, I think it will be um, March 16th or something like that. So they still have a few weeks to go, but they are like two thirds done or even three quarters done. And so for them, everything's probably clear by now. Uh, the only thing is that it will be a big challenge now wrapping everything up, putting everything together. Many teams may not quite understand how little they have done. So when they talk to each other, it looks like we are almost done. But once you start put, putting it all together in one document and trying to polish it, you realize how much more work left um, is left. And so um, often some teams find themselves surprised with uh, you know, how much more work is you know, left. And so that's the time, the last couple of weeks, that's when we, we see a lot of uh, tension and sometimes even conflicts because the teams go in that kind of overdrive mode where they're trying to finish everything up. But then the lay track, that's where even more action will be happening. So we have uh, three groups of people participating in this track. So we have the, uh, the university students. Um, so we have a total of something like 175, 78 universities in both early and late track, of which I believe 35 are in the early track. And so something like 140 universities are in the late track. And so it will be another about 4,000 students, university students who will be joining us in the late track. And then uh, we also have a sizable group of uh, the Exculture kids, as we call them, or teenagers, uh, the academy track, and uh, also some professionals. So the teenagers, most of them come, uh, so they individually uh, applied to participate in Exculture. Sometimes the teenager himself, herself, uh, filled out the form. Sometimes it was a parent. And we have, if I remember correctly, seven schools. 
So in most cases, it would be a teacher with a group of students uh, joining together. So uh, usually it's relatively small groups. Uh, so it would be like 10 to 15 students per class. And the reason for that, again, is that not every student from the teacher's class participate. In most cases, they have it set up as an after-school uh, program. So like you have a basketball club or maybe a chess club or orchestra, well, here they have an international business club. And then we also have a lot of professionals, uh, some of them actually quite experienced. So people who wanted to give, get this international experience, people who wanted to get uh, this business consulting experience, but they're not students anymore or not students at the university that participates in Exculture. So they also applied individually and uh, that's obviously very welcome and we allow that for about two years now. So they also have a sizable group and they will be participating again uh, together. And so the difference here is that we had um, the university students who are prepared by their professors and they take some training uh, provided by Exculture, but it's basically just one test that they have to complete but the professionals and the Exculture kids, they had a lot of preparation. So they had four weeks of training and they had four tests that they had to, uh, to pass. Uh, there was a high threshold, they had to get 80 on each test, uh, otherwise they're not allowed to participate in the project. And as always, we lost quite a few people, so many people signed up, but when the time came to work, uh, many found themselves not ready, either uh, language uh, not fluent enough or uh, discipline is not there. And so the reason we have those four weeks of training is not only to prepare people, but also to make sure they're fully ready and can be reliable team members. Uh, but yeah, that's where we stand. Oh, and there is a fifth group I forgot to say, uh, the coaches. So uh, every semester we take the best students from the last semester and uh, again, provide additional training, also four weeks of training. So they have to complete 16 training modules. Uh, we teach them how to deal with things like cross-cultural communication, uh, cross-cultural conflict resolution, how to provide effective feedback, uh, you know, things like that. So we teach them all kinds of things that they may need as coaches. Plus they have a lot of experience having completed the project themselves last semester. And so uh, after that, if they pass all of the tests, they become the coaches for the new generation of Exculture students. And so they can help you with sort of two primary things. One, if you would like to get feedback on your work individually. So we try to provide some feedback to students if they ask for it. But if you would like to get feedback on your specific draft, you can send it to coaching at Exculture.org and two coaches, each time we assign two coaches to each case, they will read your work and they will provide feedback. And so they have, they know a lot because they wrote the reports, but also uh, they've been trained. They, they saw literally hundreds of reports from the last semester. They helped us evaluate reports from the last semester. So they know what a good report looks like. They will be able, able to provide you some feedback. And two, if you have any challenge, any problem in the team, uh, you can uh, ask them for help. It can be something as simple as we have a difficult time scheduling a meeting, or maybe somebody on my team is not actively participating. Can you talk to him or to her? But also maybe some sort of a conflict. Uh, we don't have many, but sometimes things happen. And you obviously can ask for a coach. Again, there will be two coaches who will assist you. They can just provide you some advice, or they may be asked to investigate what's going on, talk to the rest of the team, maybe talk to the professors of the students. And so they will investigate and try to help you. And we get very positive feedback. I mean, the coaches, again, unlike professors who sometimes see things differently, the coaches are basically, you know, like you, just a little older, a little bit more experienced and specifically trained, you know, in team counseling and, you know, conflict resolution. So uh, it helps a lot uh, when you ask for their help. And so they, again, I think we got something like 200, 300 applications, maybe even more. But again, through the selection process, we always try to leave about 50 in the program. So the best of the best. And uh, that's exactly what we did this time. Okay, I'm going to stop here. So I see we have a bunch of professors. So I would like to promote you to the panelists here, um, Justin, Ragu, Yun Lee. So if you guys would like to share maybe your experience and say us, tell us a few things, uh, um, a few words of wisdom based on your experience. All of you have participated already for a while. So uh, what's your take on it? So what would you tell the students who would like to either do well or maybe even win the competition? What would be your uh, recommendation? And students, I think I'm done with my brief introduction. I'll show you some things, you know, like what the weekly surveys look like, what kind of links you will receive. But uh, if you have any questions, you can do two things. One, you can type your question in the Q&A window. So there is a, literally it says Q&A questions and answers. 
and we will provide the answers. <clears throat> and then two, you can raise your hand and I will add you here to the conference room and you will be able to ask your questions directly of me or one of the professors. So we have Justin here. So Justin is in Thailand at this time, or are you still in Singapore? In Tha Thailand, Thailand. Thailand. Yeah, Justin yeah. was traveling to Singapore a few days ago. Uh, Justin has participated many, many times in many different roles. And one of the specialties uh, or one of the special roles that Justin has, he is organizing the research hackathons, uh, has organized now several of them and is organizing another one in Canada in a few months. And so those of you who don't know, so every week you will have a weekly progress report that you need to submit. And that's for us to know how well you're doing, if you need any help, if everything's fine. But in those surveys, weekly surveys, there will be a few questions that we ask for research purposes. So for ourselves, for forex culture, but also to inform the world, we are trying to study why, for example, some teams do better than others. What causes conflicts? Uh, what kind of leadership structure works best? Uh, why some teams get to be leaders? Why some team members are more likely to perform better than others? And so we collect all kinds of data. We will measure your cultural intelligence and personality and IQ and CQ. And you will, by the way, get the results at the end of the semester. So you will know what results you get um, uh, on those tests. But then what happens, we take those data and we try to study basically you. And so this is where Justin comes along. So first he uh, helps a lot with managing the data. It's like vast amounts of data. And second, he organizes those web, I mean, hackathons, research hackathons, where a bunch of professors come together and basically do research. And so the first one he organized was in Wisconsin. So uh, he locked ourselves, uh, us, he locked us because he actually was going back and forth. But we were basically, you know, stuck in a dormitory in a beautiful little town in Wisconsin and wake up, do research until you drop, then take a little break, do some more research. And then at night, he usually would take us out, like, you know, on a boat on the river, Mississippi River, things like that. And then we did another one in uh, Denmark last year. And then this year we will do it in um, Vancouver. So Justin found a whole house for us. So we're gonna rent a whole like, big apartment, like six or seven bedrooms. And so there will be a bunch of professors stuck there for eight days uh, doing research. But anyway, Justin, sorry, that was a long introduction. So what would you tell the students if they wanna win this competition or at least have fun? And I think, yeah. Okay, okay so um, <clears throat> I think the biggest challenge is at the beginning when you're first meeting the people, you don't know who they are, you don't know what language they speak. You, uh, generally speaking, um, the typical group uh, communicates in English. So now the question is, to what extent are your members uh, fluent in the English language? Can they write and so forth? And so by the, the first part, I think, is the most important, getting to know the people, working out the schedules, who's in charge of what. Um, but then it kind of settles down a little bit where everyone takes the roles and you know we're meeting at Tuesday at 10 p.m. local time or whatever, and norms begin to form. And then at the end, as Voss mentioned earlier in this, in this video, um, I think there's a panic in the last two or three weeks. Oh my gosh, we think we're done, but when we try and actually finish it up, we're not. So you'll see a cycle and just know, calm down. You just know it's gonna happen, accept it, be part of it. And uh, during those peak times, commit and, and work through it. Yeah. Justin is actually working on a paper now <clears throat> where he studies the sort of trajectories of team life development or team stage developments um, in X culture teams. Uh, so there is this theory that says that all teams go through this, uh, you know, uh, four cycles or stages of development. What is it, Justin? Forming, norm, no, forming, storming. Storming, norming, performing. Performing, yeah. And Justin is trying to figure out why some teams get to performing faster than others. How long does it take teams to get to performing? Uh, some teams apparently can go through storming and then it looks like they're now performing, but then they go back to storming. And so norming and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully we'll have the results sometime soon. Yeah. But a lot of studies, I agree with, with you, Justin, a lot of studies show and including our own data that those first few weeks are critical and then it becomes really busy towards the end as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Raghu, Yun Lee, uh, do you have any, any comments that you would like to share with students? Uh, we have a question here uh, from uh, Mather. So that's a very good question. How do we get in touch with coaches? Uh, very good question. Uh, and the reason is, I don't know. Let me scratch that. I do know, but um, so in the past, we had um, the email address where you just send your request. You send it to coaching at xculture.org. 
then, uh, and yes, once they receive that email, uh, they will respond to you and they will uh, assign two coaches to your case and they will help you provide feedback or help with whatever you need help with, or if you just need to talk to someone. Then last year they had a link uh, and uh, you just click on that link and there is a form and it basically asks, so what kind of help you need? And you just do a few clicks and they know right away. So this way, uh, you know, uh, they can classify it a little bit more conveniently. And this semester they would like, in addition to that, they would like me to add a question in the weekly progress survey, uh, a question, do you need coaching help? And I think we will have both uh, this semester. So you will be able to send an email to uh, coaching at exculture.org as always, <clears throat> but there will be probably a question in the weekly surveys <clears throat> that will specifically ask you, uh, is everything okay? Would you like a coach to reach out to you and help you? Uh, we also tried a model in the past where each team was assigned a coach. So we would have 50 coaches and let's say at that time there were like 500 teams or 700 teams. So each coach would be responsible for like 10 or 15 teams, but that didn't work very well. And here is why one, um, uh, not all teams wanted coaches. So some teams felt that they got it under the control and they don't need anyone asking them every day. Are you okay? Do you need any help? Second, uh, maybe some coaches are a little better than others. I mean, we are all people, we are a little different. And so some teams had a sort of better coach and other teams maybe had a little lesser prepared coach. Uh, likewise, uh, some teams maybe had a lot of problems and some maybe didn't have any. And again, some coaches had a lot of work and others didn't have much. So what we do now is we assign coaches to the requests for coaching. So this way you get to work with different coaches. You can ask for the same coach if you have uh, a different issue and you know again, and you need to uh, receive help again. So you can choose to work with the same coach, but otherwise it's always rotating. So you get to work with different coaches, get feedback from different coaches and they get to work with different teams. So that seems to work a little bit better. And so that's how we do it. Um, Ragu, Yunli, if you would like to maybe add something, you can unmute your microphone and add the video if you want to do that. And again, if we have any more professors in the audience, if you would like to join us here, please let us know. Uh, there is another question from Gregory. Oh, Gregory, that's one of the professors. Um, um, yes, adjoining. That's a very good, Gregory, let me add you to this one and maybe you want to say something because that's a very good point and we, that came up in uh, the research that we do. So uh, what Professor Kimmenzer is talking about is that um, when you look at the stages of team development, uh, they added later a fifth stage. So you have forming, storming, norming, performing, and then adjourning. So, and it's important to have this kind of final stage where everything's done and now you adjourn, you go home. But it, it would be not very wise to just drop the students and say, okay, done, or a war, right? So you want to have some kind of debriefing, you know, final discussion. Uh, Gregory, is that what you meant or am I explaining that right? So it's not exactly my area. So let me see. Yeah, uh, go, yeah, go can, ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We don't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Uh, let me double check. Okay. Uh, the, the reason for um, my emphasis on a journey uh, relates to a very simple thing. First, uh, there is a need to uh, go mentally back to the experience, analyze this experience, and see which parts of uh, the experience work for each uh, member of the team. Uh, what is the baggage which they will carry on uh, through their lives? Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, GVTs are so proliferating in most companies, they need to understand, uh, they need to process this experience internally. And uh, one more thing, which is important, and you already mentioned this, I want uh, each student to present to the whole class after the end of the project to make sure that uh, this experience is shared. And uh, my, my motto for this purpose is share to gain, because each of the shared thoughts is a gain for the author of these thoughts, because they have to to formalize the experience, to think it through, and uh, formulate what is the most important, uh, um, the most important okay. part within that experience, and uh, they have to share it so other uh, students uh, can learn from it. Exactly, they could uh, learn from someone's mistakes instead of doing them themselves. Yeah, and we actually have most professors have big um, adjourning stage, so. Um, for some professors, the, the project is basically over on the last day of the semester and they don't have much time 
but I still see most professors would have some post-project discussions and you know um, presentations maybe and things like that. But at some schools, uh, the universities actually do a big, big you know celebration. In many cases, they would invite the president of the university, sometimes even the mayor of the city. Uh, in many cases, they would have uh, like the, the students would take out the professor to a restaurant where the professor takes out the students to a restaurant where you can observe some cultural differences. Like for example, our students in Italy, Spain and France in many cases would have that celebration with alcohol. And so when we get the photos at the end of the project from those celebrations, uh, you would see like a professor with students at a bar, you know, like with beer or wine. And so if I did this in the United States, I would definitely be fired. So like drinking alcohol with students, that's not very common. And in France, I remember, you know, we have actually quite a few photos of students and professors having some fun. That's perfectly normal. So they just go and have a drink, have a beer or a wine or, you know, not get drunk, but just, you know, have some celebration. So definitely something that is a little unusual. If you, let me share the screen here. Um, if you go to, let me see three. If you go to Exculture's website and click on photos, so here you will be able to see some of the photos from our um, previous um, um, semesters. And so some of those photos, did I click on the right thing? So, oh, it seems like it takes me to Facebook and for some reason Facebook is moving very slowly today. Um, okay. Uh, well, anyway, you will see a lot of photos there, especially from those adjoining, you know, sort of post-project celebrations. And uh, you will be able to see some of those, you know, you will see how very different the uh, students celebrate the end of the project in different countries. Some would even, you know, like uh, order a cake with a big, you know, Exculture logo on it and things like that. So here you have some of the photos from one of the semesters. So, you know, with the certificates and, you know, some of them apparently with the costumes. I'm not sure what's going on there. So, uh, but something like this. So I'm not sure why my computer is so slow. So uh, another thing, yeah, so that's one of the universities, uh, Peru, so Isan University by uh, Jorge del Castillo, one of our professors. From us, from Exculture, what we do at the end, um, we will send you a big package of documents that you will be able to add to your portfolio. So first, everybody will get a certificate, something like this. And then uh, we used to give certificates only but then hundreds of students would ask for recommendation letters. They would say, um, I'm applying for a job or maybe applying to a university. Can you give me a recommendation letter so I can um, uh, show it to my you know, potential employers or, or um, selection committee at the university? And so having written hundreds of them one by one, it takes a lot of time. We have decided that now we will send one to everybody by default. And that's exactly what we do. So you will get a loan document, uh, it will contain something like 10, 12 pages. And so in that document, you will have first your personal performance review. So the document will talk, it's only for you. So nobody else gets that, but your professors don't even get that. And it will talk about your performance in great detail, uh, how well you did, how your performance compares to the performance of other students, uh, what you need to do to do better next time, things like that. Second, uh, you will get the results of the tests that you have completed. So you will have taken by the end of the project several tests. Um, we will see what we will measure this semester, but usually we measure cultural intelligence, emotional intelligence, uh, IQ, uh, and maybe personality, and there may be a few other things. And so we try to package all of that and send it to you again with a lot of discussion, what those numbers mean, how they compare it to the average in the population, and most importantly, what you can do to improve your numbers in the future. So, and then finally, you will get a recommendation letter that will be uh, discussing what you've done, your experience, the skills you have acquired, uh, the, the experiences you acquired, and then obviously that you are recommended for a team-based uh, complex project, or sometimes maybe not. So there will be a few students who will not do well. And so their recommendation letter will say, I, I cannot recommend a student like this for, for an important project. Most of you will be fine, so don't worry. But again, the, the letters are you know, honest and uh, do not sort of pad your performance. It is what it is. Um, so um, let me see, there are a few more questions here that I wanted to uh, answer, but um, Justin, um, uh, Gregory, if you have any questions, so let me see while I'm reading questions, if you would like to maybe join and share um, if you have any other comments. Um, I can- oh, Raghu is here, okay, go yeah, ahead, please. I can talk about a couple of things. One, uh, as Justin was saying, the first few weeks are really turbulent for the teams. And it's important as instructors that we stay with our students to kind of 
guide them. It's easy for them to kind of lose hope if they're not hearing back from their teammates. Yeah. It's important from the instructor's perspective to kind of support their students. But also what I do is to minimize the panic over the last couple of weeks. And uh, in my experience, the panic happens because students end up doing only short surveys and they just collect 200 words, 300 words of material to post it on the surveys. And then they realize they have to write a 20 page paper. So I kind of nudge my students to kind of develop three, four pages for every module right at the beginning and just post summaries on the surveys, but have all the work done so that in the end, it's a little more smoother. Yeah. So that's that's something that as instructors, we need to kind of urge. But also for students, it's important that although you write 200 words in a survey, that's not the work. You need to have your work done in a weekly basis so that you don't end up stressed out in the end. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, <clears throat> and I totally agree with you on that. Sometimes students come to me and say, oh, I had such a great team. Everything worked fine. Everybody was working hard and we had everything completed like two weeks early. And I'm kind of happy for those students. But at the same time, I sometimes feel like they don't really learn much because when you work in a team, any team, like literally any team face to face, corporate, everybody is an employee or a global virtual team as it is in Exculture student teams there will be always problems. I mean, most of the time you will have uh, one student who may not be working hard, maybe another student or team member or employee on the team uh, who is maybe too bossy or maybe too shy and is not saying much or maybe too lazy or maybe got sick or broke up with boyfriend, girlfriend or is going through some terrible, I don't know, uh, family issues. And so because of that, they cannot fully participate or maybe a little bit too I don't know, uh, angry all the time, who knows? And so there will be something like that pretty much every time. And you probably will have one or maybe even two or three of those people on your team. And while during the project, it may feel like it's a lot of, you know, like, why do I need to deal with that? What I hope you recognize is the whole purpose of Exculture is to uh, sort of show you what real life looks like. Exculture is almost like a time machine, like a, you know, time viewing device. So whatever you experience here, it is a true preview of what is in store for you in the future. You will graduate in a semester or two, maybe in a year, you will get a job and you will definitely have many projects where you will have to work in a team. And so if you think that Exculture team is difficult to work with, wait until you have a real team. You will have the same problems. I've seen enough studies and I have worked in enough, uh, in, in enough teams myself and have spoken to many people. And I see the same problem again and again and again. And so if you're experiencing those problems, I hope you recognize it's sort of, I don't want to say it's a good thing, but that's the whole purpose. That's, that's how you learn. That's, that's the experience. And as I said, even if you end the project with, you know, enemies in five continents and, uh, you know, uh, working hard and maybe not getting the results you want, the important thing is that that's how you learn. And the next time when you are in a team, when those things happen again, which they will, you will know better what to expect. You will know better what to do about it. And you will definitely be much more prepared and will do better the next time. So again, I kind of hope all of you will have a great experience and everybody loves each other and everybody is, you know, always working hard. But if you have one of those teams, remember that it's not true representation of what, you know, working in teams is like. So, yeah. And again, many teams actually do very well. We have teams that, you know, uh, uh, fall in love with one, with one another, sometimes literally. We actually had, I, I was recently told that we had a student from Pennsylvania who fell in love with her team member from Italy. And then we had the symposium in Italy where they met face to face. He was from a different city. And then he proposed, she accepted, and they got married. And they actually work somewhere in Pakistan now for some I don't know, organization that has an office there. So even that happens. Again, it's not something I promote, but, you know, why not? But when I mean, you know, uh, when I say fell in love, you know, like everybody likes each other. People connect all the time, talk about different things, music, movies, cars. I don't know, whatever students talk, talk about this time. It's great. We encourage that. Wonderful. But do expect at least some challenges. And, and you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, somebody is also asking about coaches assigned uh, to teams. Yes, it will be more or less randomly assigned. Um, the way we do is do it is we try to assign um, cases to coaches in a way that each coach works on different types of cases. We have, I think, eight different classifications, like conflict, free rider, 
uh, meeting schedule, you know, things like that, and then feedback. So there are several typical issues that we deal with uh, when, when coaches ask for help. And so uh, the program directors are trying to assign coaches in a way that each coach has had a few cases of each type and then also hopefully help a few different teams so that they can get a variety of, of you know, personalities and people. Likewise, the same thing with the teams. If you're asking for coach and you don't request a specific coach, you will uh, be assigned a different coach each time. But then again, if you like one particular coach, you can ask for that coach. Uh, I think we have a page on the website where you can see photos and bios of all of the coaches, where they come from. So again, you can choose if you want, although I don't think there is much difference uh, until you try. Um, Justin is asking about symposium in, in Singapore. Um, that's a very good question, Justin. Uh, so for many years, we've been doing these uh, global symposia. Let me see if I can show you the photos. So the very first one was in um, uh, Istanbul, Turkey, hosted by Mercedes-Benz. And then each of those pictures, that's another symposium that we had over time with a total of I think we've had like 13 or 14 of them now. The last one was in San Antonio a few uh, months ago, and before that it was in Canada, San Antonio, Texas in the United States, and before that it was in Calgary, Canada. And then the next one is supposed to take part uh, place in uh, Singapore. And the problem is uh, we are not sure if we are going to go ahead with it. So we already got the uh, in applications more than we need from the students. We already got the four local companies that will be hosting the event. We even booked the uh, opening ceremony um, venue. If you've seen the movie Crazy Rich Asians, uh, so they have a big celebration in one of those halls and we booked that hall. Back. Like that's where we were supposed to have the opening ceremony and even made a prepayment of $5,000 but now we still did not open the registration portal and the reason for that is um, the coronavirus so uh everybody's you know very scared and crazy about it and the university started issuing uh, the uh, travel advisories not to travel uh, at all and especially to asia and so we took a little time off to uh, monitor the situation we still have time and so we will be making the final decision in another week or two if the panic subsides uh, we will go ahead but if everything looks like it may not work, uh, we may have to reschedule. So maybe it will be later in the year or wait until the next year, which is a little problematic because we already made plans for 2021 as well. Also a very interesting, exciting location. So we'll have to see, um, nobody knows. And you're watching the news, you know how things are working with that. Um, one thing that I wanted to show you again, let me share the screen. Uh, so you know what it looks exactly like when you get your weekly progress survey link. So once a week, usually on Wednesday, you will receive an email that looks like this. And let me open it so you can see the actual email. So this one I sent to myself. So every time I send an email to you, I send a copy to myself so I can make sure everything works. But basically it says, hi, your name. Here is your weekly progress survey link and you have a link. And then there will be some announcements maybe like, for example, coaching, you know, how you can reach coaches here. Uh, there will be a little bit on peer evaluations. We have done a lot of studies and our research shows that it works best when you see everybody's peer evaluations. So therefore you will see all your team members. And here I just made up some six names for my own team and uh, you see what the peer evaluations for each team um, uh, member are, and you have the countries of each team member. And all you have to do is by Sunday, so we go on a kind of weekly cycle, so uh, all, uh, all uh, weekly progress reports are due on Sunday. So you just click it sometime before Sunday, and this is what it does, it just opens the survey. And this is the survey that the early track has to do this week, so by March the 1st, by tomorrow. And so um, each time it's basically the same thing. So you don't need to wait for the survey link to work on the project because you know what, what needs to be done each week from the challenge instructions. So this is only to report to us if everything's fine. And so you choose the company. Let's say I want to work on Dart drones. Uh, let's say I'm the one who will be uploading the uh, weekly uh, progress file. Again, those are not graded, but we want to see how well you're doing. I would drop the file here. Then there would be a few questions, just like I said, for research purposes. So uh, this week we are trying to understand, so like ethics is a big issue in international business. Different people have different understandings about what is ethical, what is not, what's the right decision, what is the wrong decision. In X culture, it's an issue. Sometimes we have a conflict where one person doesn't see it as a problem and another one does. But we also want to try trying to understand better around the world, you know, how people have, you know, 
different ethical judgments, make different ethical judgments about different things. And so you have a few things here, a few questions, and you just answer them like this. And then um, we have a few other questions about how you predict your performance to be, again, both trying to understand where you stand, but also trying to understand how the self-promotion and self-assessment affects your performance in team. And then a few questions, basically like peer evaluation. So is everything okay? You will write, you know, your experiences so that we know what's going on, how many people in your team are working hard. Let's say all six people are working hard. Have you had any conflicts, no conflict, or maybe you had one task related conflict or four of them. And then, uh, you know, if there is any big problem, you click here, we will then investigate and peer evaluations. So for example, have you communicated with this person? Yes, many times. How about this one? Yes, many times. How about this one? No, I didn't communicate to this with this one. And then is this person working hard? Yes, very hard, has creative ideas. You know, you just fill it out and yep, you are done. And then a couple other things, is everything clear? Are you motivated? Yes, uh, everything's fine. Yes, absolutely. Are you enjoying it? Yes. Is everything clear? Nothing's clear. I have no idea what I need to do, or maybe everything's clear. And yeah, and for the first few weeks, we may be able to add more team members to your team. So we have some students who join late because the, the semester starts late. So if you feel like you need more team member, you say yes. I cannot guarantee that we will have a team member um, uh, available for your team. But uh, if possible, we will try to do it. And we may have, like in, for, in the first week, we may have a few dozen people and then it would be fewer and fewer. So, but if you really need an additional team member, we may be able to add one. So that's where we stand. <clears throat> okay, let's see if there are more questions. And um, if, if, so do we have any more professors? So uh, Raghu, uh, Raghu what, what state are you in, Raghu? I think you're Pennsylvania. in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And Gregory, you are also in Pennsylvania, aren't you? Yeah, I think Gregory is also in Pennsylvania. I'm in Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut, sorry, Connecticut, Connecticut, right. So yeah, it's kind of East Coast, but a little, yeah. And Justin is in, in um, uh, Thailand, although again, started, worked in the United States before that, Canada before that. And Yun Li, I, I can't remember again, the university. So, but anyway, um, let me see if you have any comments. Now is a good time. And meanwhile, I'll see if we missed any questions. Uh, for both students and instructors, I have a suggestion that has worked wonders with me. Anytime students face small issues with their team, I usually bring it up in the class and let other students pitch in with their feedback. And sometimes this works wonders and they come up with very creative ways because they're dealing with other students of their own age and type. So they come up with ideas that suit better to handle and manage situations. So I usually dedicate half an hour every week to kind of just have an open discussion. I can do that because I have small classes, 10 to 15 students. It might be hard if you have more, but if even otherwise you can let students be in groups and students can ask their classmates yeah. to get some insights into kind of how to deal with certain situations because this is a collaborative experience. You're not competing with your classmates right, right. in in-house teams. So you're competing with others. So it kind of helps to kind of get some input and feedback from your classmates to deal with situations. Exactly. And, and yes, it's very important that professors allocate a few minutes at the beginning of each lecture. Uh, sometimes students may have, you know, one may not be brave enough to ask the question, but maybe somebody else is having the same issue. Uh, sometimes they even have students who would have a laptop and say, hey, I have my team here on Skype. You know, everybody say hi. And everybody says hi. And sometimes it takes almost too much time. But, you know, yeah. But yes, we definitely want the professors to do it. Um, let me show you one picture. So I, I like this one very much. So at the, at the end of the last semester in um, uh, December, uh, one of our universities in Saudi Arabia had a big Exculture celebration. So they not only had a cake with the Exculture logo on it, they had a little cupcake with the name of each of the students on it. So I thought that was really cool. So I don't know how much it cost and how difficult it was to do, but they had all those, you know, wonderful photos here. So, and, you know, like everybody got a certificate, a flower, uh, a cupcake. So that's, you know, that's very nice if you can do it. So uh, there is a very interesting question posted uh, here by uh, Justin about multiple um, takes of the readiness test. So everybody has to take the readiness test, no exceptions. And there are several reasons for that. One, obviously that's how we know 
that you are present, that your email works. Uh, the first time we did Xculture, we just put students on Teams without checking all of that. It turns out some students dropped the course, for some the email was spelled wrong. So obviously the readiness test sort of makes sure that you, know, you are there, you're participating, you're receiving our emails, but two, you are you know, prepared and you are ready to be a team member. Nobody wants to have a slacker on the team who is not capable of you know, uh, thinking and reading in English and, you know, answering a few questions and going online at a specific time. And so one thing that we even found is that uh, rather than the percentage of correctly answered questions, an even better predictor is percentage of the questions attempted, meaning that if a student does not answer all of the questions, there are a total of about 100 total questions in the readiness test. And so if the student attempts only like 90% of the questions, like skips some or submits without answering all of the questions, that's usually a big red flag. Usually that means that the student is not diligent enough and that is a big problem. It's even worse than if the student uh, tried every question but maybe didn't know answers to some of them. But now in terms of if you wanna take it the second time, so if you fail the first time, and I don't know, Justin, Raghu, guys, you, you tell me what you think. The way the system is set up is that if you fail the test, the system sends you automatically a retake link and you can take it again. In the past, it would send you the retake link immediately. And so like 90% of the students pass the test on the first try, another like seven, 8% pass it on the second try. But then there would be a few students who take it again and again and again. And I think the record, I've seen somebody took it like 25 times until the, the person passed it. And then the question becomes, should we allow those students to participate or not? Like if the student could not pass it, you know, on the second try. On the one hand, I mean, that actually tells me that the student is probably not very serious. On the other hand, taking that test takes like half an hour and the student took it like 20 times or 25 times. I mean, that's gotta be worth something. I mean, just the stamina and dedication. I don't know, it almost looks like the student at some point was just randomly clicking, hoping that, you know, this time it will work, but I don't know so. So what I did this time, we have a delay of one hour. So if you fail the test, uh, you will get a new link, but it will be an hour later. So this way you can't just, you know, take, 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 take. You have to wait and you cannot take it more than a few times a day. So, but I don't know, what's your take on that? I, I don't really know the answer. Should we allow people to take it more than once or more than twice? Uh, I don't okay, know, Justin, so, Raghu, so I, I have a, a fairly firm opinion on this. Uh, very rarely do I have a firm opinion. And that is my students in Thailand, uh, many of them struggle with English. So mm -hmm. though they try hard, they don't quite understand the, the questions and perhaps even the answers to the questions. And so they're dedicated, they wanna work hard, and my, one of the reasons I put them on the Teams for X culture is to get them to interact with people who use English more fluently. And so by removing them, now I have to make a project that's comparable to X culture. And just to be truthful, most of them will not be able to do, write the paragraphs and the sentences that are needed. So they need the support and that's why I, I asked them to do it. Um, so if they're failing the test, and I had one student email me today with this question, um, it may not be because in this case, she uh, is not working hard or trying her best. It's just because she really uh, can't, can't do it. And so uh, she needs the support is basically the bottom line. So then your opinion is no retakes? No, I, I would say the opposite. I would say maybe oh, I like the hour, the hour yeah. delay, but she, she needs the support from yeah. her team members to help her with English and so forth. Yeah. Um, because without that support, she would not be able to do this type of yeah. project. We are working on a project now with Monju where we are trying to see uh, what people expected to be problems and what actually turned out to be problems. So in your readiness test, there is a set of questions where we ask you to what extent do you think uh, language differences will be a problem or cultural differences will be a problem or um, times, I mean, inability to schedule a meeting, you know, things like that. And then at the end, we ask you, so looking back, uh, to what extent was it a problem? And so what's interesting that at the beginning, before people are placed on teams, everybody thinks that the biggest problems will be time zones and language differences. In the end, actually, those are not really big problems. They say, yeah, language was, you know, some people were not fluent, big deal, you know, they used Google Translate or maybe they just did more research and we did more write-up. So somehow it doesn't turn out to be a big issue that people thought it would be, or maybe because most students speak English because we tested for them, you know, they speak enough. What turns out to be the problem is basically uh, some people were just not responsible enough. 
maybe some people lacked the technical expertise who wanted to use Dropbox or Google Docs or Slack, and some people just didn't know how to do it or didn't want to do it. They just wanted to stick with email. So sort of the big things related to cultural differences are often expected to be a problem. But then look at Mac, it usually just mundane little things like just be basically showing up and doing the work as opposed to, you know, knowing something or cultural intelligence. I mean, all of those other things matter too, but not as much as students thought they would. So, yeah. Um, uh, may, may I suggest uh, two, two thoughts, not, not solutions, but two thoughts. Uh, one is uh, if we have uh, students who struggle with understanding of the X culture materials, I am afraid that these students will be afraid, will yeah. be uh, not able to contribute to the team because they would not understand the essence of the of the project. They would not be able to understand what is needed and how it could be developed and done. So these students may become, um, I would say, uh, not uh, a dead weight, but um, something like. Uh, uh, Late comers, or maybe no comers, into the uh, into the work of the team, and then uh, the whole team may be very frustrated by having such a student who doesn't understand anything. Yeah, this is a concern. Uh, the second thing, which relates to uh, to the technicality of the test, I I do believe that uh, sending a link uh, with an hour delay would be helpful and. Um, there should be maybe a warning which could be sent uh, immediately. Uh, please take a, a look at the manual, uh, yeah. read it, and prepare. Yeah. If you uh, <clears throat> you are ready, then we will provide you with a link to retake the test. In this situation, uh, instead of just sending um, a retake uh, link, it will be uh, a task which is given to a student to get better prepared. And when the link becomes available, the student hopefully will take it with a better result. And that's exactly what we do. So um, when the students complete the test, they have the results right there on the screen. So when they click submit, they see right away how many questions they got right. They, they don't get the question by question review, but they know that they passed or didn't pass. The only difference is that this semester, um, they say you will get a new link and you will be able to retake the test if you fail it but it takes an hour before they get that link. And so this way, first, they can spend their time preparing. And second, they cannot just, you know, randomly click, click, click until they get the, the correct sequence right. Somebody also asked if the second time the questions are the same. Yes, they are the same. The only thing is that some of the questions are randomized, so they may appear in a different order, but overall it's the same test, yes. Uh, there is also a question um, uh, from Esther. Um, I would like to ask uh, what we will be graded on regarding the work involving in teams, so basically evaluation. Uh, so the ultimate sort of outcome is the report that your team writes. Most professors assign a lot of weight to that, but it's not everything. So uh, you will also have weekly peer evaluations, and I actually care about those more with my students than the final report. So I care more about the process, about you doing your job and keeping your team happy than the actual final report. Again, I want the final reports to be good. They still weight, I think, 50% of the total grade. But those weekly progress surveys, I pay a lot of attention to them. And again, they don't have to be perfect. Uh, not everything needs to go well. You don't have to get perfect peer evaluations, but I want to see that the student is participating and generally has his or her team happy with his or her performance. And so again, it's a little different from professor to professor because first we have again cultural differences. Some professors feel that um, it should be more about your individual performance and we measure a lot of individual things, you know, your effort, your intellectual contribution, your friendliness, your communication, uh, your own, you know, weekly surveys. Uh, others believe that it's more about teamwork. So we allow professors to have some freedom. We only tell them that um, the Exculture project must account for no less than 20% of the total course grade. And usually it's about 35% on average. Like in my course, for example, it's 35% of the course when I teach it as an international business. And this time I actually have a group of uh, graduate students for whom this is the course. So they do the preparation and the project is the course. It's like 100% it's, it's, it's the project. But then also we say it's no less than 20% the peer evaluations. And again, for some semester, for some professors, they assign more weight, others less, but those are the main components. 
Um, and then also there is a question, how do we select the people for symposium? Um, so we invite those who have successfully completed the project, usually inviting about top 25, 20% of the students. And we'll look at, there are a total of 124 performance indicators. So your weekly surveys and there are multiple things there, the quality of the reports you did, uh, the quality of the comments you provided, your performance on the test. So we'll look at all kinds of things. And usually, as long as you do pretty well, you will be invited. So it's a generally, you know, a, a wide field. So uh, as long as you did, you know, better than most, you will be invited. But what happens then is you will be invited to apply. And so then you apply and your application also includes uh, recommendation letters, includes your own statement why you should be selected. And so we look at those more carefully and then make the final selections based on those application packages. But it's still a fairly large group of people and not everyone can come obviously, you know, for some the schedule doesn't work for others, it's too expensive to travel. So my experience is that as long as you do pretty well, you have a very good chance of being selected. And as long as you're willing to come, you know, it, it should work. I mean, it's not everyone obviously, but it's not like a lottery where, you know, one out of 5,000 will be invited. No, no, it's, it's a sizable group of people. So you have a good chance there. Um, professors, any other comments? So we have here several professors. I'm not sure if there are any more in the audience. If there are, raise your hand. I will add you. We need to stop in a minute or two because we have a webinar for the coaches. And so we need to stop this one because the system would not allow it to at the same time. So any last minute, quick, last minute questions? Quick question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Go. This go is great. Uh, student, some students have preferences for the uh, projects in which they want to participate. How these preferences will be taken into account when the teams are formed? Um, not taken into account at all. So the teams are formed randomly. We did try to allow students to either choose what countries they want to be you know, what want to be represented on their teams or if they want to be with some students. But I will be honest with you, first, we have thousands of people and it's very, very hard, uh, you know, to accommodate those requests. Second, we have, uh, you know, minimal resources. It's basically me, my teaching assistant, Simone. Uh, we have also a few people who help us with IT. And by the way, I need to introduce here, so Julia Onofriuchuk here, so um, her Maiden name is actually translated to English lucky, so I like that one as well. So uh, if everything goes fine, probably she will start today as yet another executive administrator for the program helping us because it's just too much work. And so when the time comes to form teams, um, we tried letting students express their preferences, but I will be honest to you first, it's just too much information to process. Like we just simply, it's, it's impossible to account for every you know, preference. Second, mathematically, it's not always possible to do it because as I said, we have different number of people from different countries countries. We are trying to match you by age, like the teenagers are always with teenagers, the professionals are always with professionals, MBA students are usually with other MBA students and undergraduates are usually with other undergraduates, unless it's an older student in the undergraduate program, we may move that person to someone more of their experience. But otherwise, we do not allow you to express your preferences, you get what you get, you will get a team, usually six people to start, there will be uh, usually probably two from the United States from different states. Like you may have one from North Carolina and one from California, <clears throat> and you will probably have four people from other countries. And then you can either ask for more people later down the road, and we may be able to add an, a new person, or you may lose someone, maybe somebody will drop a course or something else will go wrong. So there may be only five of you left or maybe even four. And um, uh, so there may be some changes happening during the project, but basically that's how it works. And so, um, yeah, you get whoever, whoever you get, they will be roughly of your age and your experience, but everybody from somewhere else, and you make it work with those people. We don't move people under no circumstances, we move people to new teams. Uh, so we would have always like two, three people in a given semester who says, my team is bad, I want a new team. No, we don't do that. What we can do is if somebody is really bad, like not behaving well, uh, we can uh, drop that person from the project. Like if someone is too prone to conflict or is not doing anything, we can kick out that person from the project and it happens to a few people every semester. And vice versa, we can replace that person with someone new. So we can recompose your team, but we never ever move people to new teams. And one of the reasons is because if we do it, it, it just creates too more, many more problems. First of all, what happens to the team after you leave? 
Second, do how do we find a team that wants a new person? Third, you know, usually people who want to switch teams are you know kind of more prone to conflict, and so nobody wants them. And not, not not nobody wants them. It just creates too many things, too many issues. So we can recompose your team, add more people, maybe drop some problematic team members, but we usually don't move people to new teams. So don't even ask for that. The answer will be no. So thank you. Yeah, and, and with professors, one last comment before we go. So um, uh, some professors make a big mistake, um, sort of, how should I say it, when a student comes to them with a challenge, which, which again happens sometimes, some professors would say, oh, you are so poor, you have such a bad team, I feel so bad for you. Let me talk to the administrators and let me tell them to move you to a better team or let me tell you know, them to help you. And then the student sort of now thinks that if the problem is not solved, you, the professor, is guilty because you know you promised to solve it and you didn't. And in many cases, it's not under anybody's control. If there is someone on the team who is not performing well, I mean, what can we do about that? I mean, we can talk to those people, but it's still not guaranteed that it will be solved. A much better response for the professor would be to say something like, well, I'm sorry you're going through those challenges. Just try your best. Don't stress about it. So uh, do your best, but if it doesn't work, that's okay. I understand. For me, it's important that you try and that you gain that experience. And that's the whole purpose of the project. So as long as you do your weekly surveys, as long as you submit a report as a team, even if it's not the best report, you'll still get full, a full grade. So don't worry, you know, try your best, but I'm here, you know, and I understand your situation. And in that case, students first take the responsibility. Second, they uh, stress less, so they know that it's not the end of the world. And, um, and yeah, so I guess uh, we'll see how things go. Okay, so thank you very much for attending, Justin, Raghu, Yun Lee, uh, Julia, Gregory. We have, it looks thank like, you. up to 100 students at, given to, at a given point. And um, yeah, you will receive your team assignments on Monday. And then good luck. So thank you so much. Okay. <laughs>